morning. Good morning. Good morning. The scripture reading today will be found on pages 864 and 865 in your Bible, and is John 4, verses 5 to 42. It is a long one. <laughs> and in the first verse, I will be reading the odd-numbered verses. You will be reading the even number. When we get to verse 42, we'll read that together. In the first uh, verse that I read, there's the name of a city. I hope I pronounce it right. If I don't, please forgive me. <laughs> and there are two or three places in there where we will be um, changing in the middle of a sentence, which is kind of unusual. All right, we will begin. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go and call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, uh, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but he said that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. But the hour is coming, and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as those to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do well of him. Do you not say, four months more, 
then comes the harvest. But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be choice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that which you should not know your neighbor. Others have labor, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. That was, a, that was a long one, wasn't it? That was a long, that was a long reading. <clears throat> I think it's safe to say <clears throat> that our world has seen a lot of changes this past week. We have been reminded yet again just how globalized everything is and how, and how we are connected we are as people. The stories coming in from all over the world have been both concerning and maybe even we would say frightening, while also offering glimpses of reassurance that even in the bleakest of times that there is hope to be found in the darkest of places. The resiliency of the human spirit, if nothing else, is just, it's just doggone inspiring. I could list so many Examples of this as many stories are flooding our news feeds almost constantly. But the one that sticks out comes from Italy, where COVID-19, the coronavirus, has brought most of the country to a stop. I read that outside of grocery stores and pharmacies, every other business is shut down or closed. In fact, because again, the world is a small place, I had a conversation this week with someone who has a family member in Italy who shared a bit of insight as to what is going on over there. The person said that they are indeed practicing that social distancing in these places that are open. And what that looks like, for example, is number of people, they're only allowing in a limited number of people, and that there are lines marked on the floor as to indicate the preferred distance from person to person. Trying to imagine that, I admit, is really difficult to even try to get our head around. Now, I've never been to Italy or anywhere else in Europe, but I know that just like here, there are cultures over there that have strong community ties that call and bind people together. Like here, the people of Italy like to sit and eat and drink with one another it's difficult to fathom how hard it must be for a people whose personality is so ingrained in closeness to practice a countrywide quarantine. What does that sort of isolation stretching out over the course of a couple weeks, what does, that, what does that do to people? Some might think it would make them stir crazy. You know, I've heard the tales of cabin fever here in Vermont and know that even the most introverted folks need human contact every now and then. This kind of situation could raise so many emotions and so many feelings ranging from loneliness to lowered self-esteem, the development of social anxiety, several different mental health concerns, including that of depression. Those are some heavy and potential consequences those in isolation face. And yet, as I follow the response of the people in Italy, I've seen a people not allowing a difficult circumstance to defeat them. If you were to go home and Google Italy quarantine, you might see stories of what I just described to you, but you'd also seen something quite inspiring. From cities like Salerno and Naples in the south, 
and the Sicilian capital of Palermo in the north, the Italian people, particularly those living in apartment or condo style buildings, are stepping out on their balconies and joining each other in song. Some sing, some play instruments, some just act as DJs. I even saw one video where a large number of re residents in one building were singing the 1996 earworm song, The Macarena. <laughs> now that song is in Spanish, so I won't try to repeat it, and I sure am not gonna try to react what the dance looks like that goes with it. I'll spare you all of me trying to dance. But the people in the tower block were singing the song and doing the dance, and they were just not allowing their current state of affairs to completely separate them from one another. They found a way. While adhering to the government protocol and medical professional recommendations, they found a way not to become detached, to not to become beaten, and not to become emptied of themselves. Their songs are a message of hope and a reassuring example that we have the spiritual fortitude to get through times like this. My mind can't help but connect the ideas of separation, loneliness, and emptiness to the time of Lent. We heard the story just a few weeks ago about Jesus in the desert, isolated from everyone, experiencing a level of loneliness perhaps some of us can relate to and the emptying of himself, both physically and spiritually, in that moment. By the end of his 40 days in the desert and his temptation by the enemy, he is famished and completely drained. In that story, angels rush in to care for him and his needs. We as readers, you know, even today or maybe even then, we don't know how that actually played out. What, did, what really happened there? Did the angels rush in and physically carry him back to his followers? Did they cover him with their presence and sustain him? Did the angels show up with something to eat, maybe acting like a first century grub hub or something? I don't know. We just don't know how that plays out. All we know is that because of his trials, the angels rushed to him in order to end his isolation, to end the loneliness, and to address the emptiness. And while we as Christians at time lean heavily on the divinity of Jesus, you know, we put a major focus on the Christ part of his identity. We are reminded in that story and the scripture we heard as well this morning that Jesus, while being fully God, was also fully human. He experienced those things completely the way you or I would. Jesus was in the desert and found himself empty. And as we heard already, that wasn't the only time that was to happen to him over the course of his life and ministry. Last week, we heard Jesus tell Nicodemus in the dead of night that God so loved the world. That expression works itself out in the encounter we heard in the reading this morning. Jesus and his followers are leaving Judea and heading to the region of Galilee. But we are told that they had to go through Samaria. And there are many ways to describe the viewing of Samaria and the people who called it home. Samaria, for those in the Jesus camp, was seen as, uh, there's a lot of expressions for this, but it was seen as, you know, it's the bad part of town, wrong side of the tracks, a place you avoided if you could. The folks who lived there, the Samaritans, were outsiders in every sense of the word. And sometimes when I explain this to people, I was like, I don't know if you ever watched the Harry Potter movies, but there's a scene in one of the movies where uh, a pretty uh, nasty student calls another student a mudblood. And it was a way of expressing that they weren't fully human. They, were, they, they didn't get to participate in everything, that they were, they were less than. They were outsiders. And Samaritans were outside in so many different senses. They were outside the preferred religious system. They were outside what was socially deemed as acceptable. They were outside of, of the political standings of Jewish influence. And we take all this into account. Is it any surprise that his actions to embody what he claimed, that God so loved the world that Jesus makes his way to a place most of those in Jewish culture would choose rather not to set foot in. There is so much that goes on in this encounter at the well. You know, as a preacher, it's, uh, this is a story you can do a lot with. So many possibilities of where this scripture can take you. We could spend time unpacking the difference between Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman at the well. They run really in contrast to one another. Nicodemus, a teacher of Israel, coming at night with his last words to Jesus' proclamation, how can this be? 
And then we have this unnamed, unnamed woman at the well, seen with Jesus in the middle of the day, with her last words to him being, I know the Messiah is coming to proclaim all things to us. There's a message in that for somebody this morning. Many preachers, you know, they might focus on the perceived sin of the woman and Jesus' forgiveness of that sin. You know, I, I think that's been a message that's been shared a lot in the past because, you know, we still have a very heavy number of men that are preachers. And for some reason, you know, proven over the course of time, men are just fixated on the sin of women. <laughs> that's a message that could use some appropriate retelling for another time since it never actually states what the woman's sin was or never comes out and says Jesus forgave her. But again, we'll just leave that where it is. Or perhaps we could search the irony that Nicodemus, who had heard of Jesus and saw him teach firsthand, come away doubtful, while the woman who had no prior knowledge of him moved from doubt to belief that Jesus was the I am. And if you go back and look at this in the original Greek, there is no he on the end of that I am he. It just ends. It just says I am, which is a big indicator. We could chase so many of those ideas. But given where we are today in the season of Lent, in the midst of global pandemic, in the throes of self-imposed quarantines, I think we need to be reminded that Jesus walked into a strange place and made his way to the community well and asked a woman there to help him lower her bucket and fetch some water because he was empty and needed something to drink. How absurd does that sound? Some things that, you know, they only sound silly when you say them out loud. And this is one of those things. And, you know, right now in a normal circumstances, my, my wife would be downstairs and she would be you know, teaching kids about all these different things, just like some of the other volunteers who have stepped up for WOW. And they go down there and they talk to the children of our church. They lay these foundational stones and they share stories about God and the vastness and bigness of God, of, of a God who birthed and uh, set aside and put into place all creation as we know it, and the God who created all things, and the God who caused bread to come from heaven, and the God who caused the sea to part from Moses and his people, and the, the God who shows up in the burning bush, and God who moved about in the thunder, and the God who has say and influence over all the universe. <coughs> And yet, we who hold to Jesus as the Christ, God in the flesh, have to come to terms with the same God that did all those things, moseyed up to a well because he was thirsty. The God of the universe was thirsty. You know, we often get caught up on the living water comment he promises this woman. But the miracle of this story is that the God of the universe was thirsty. And that fact alone holds ramifications for us as it displays the very human aspect of Jesus and demonstrates his ability to feel emptiness. And we see that in this instance. When Jesus feels empty, he needs his bucket lowered and invites the woman to participate in the act of doing it for him. It's the language of lowering our own bucket that I want to focus on this morning. In what ways are we doing that? Not only at this time, but in all aspects of our life. How are we doing that through the spirit that God has given us? We can look at Jesus' actions this morning and find it all too easy to identify as him in this story. We might see ourselves as the one who finds these people like the Samaritan woman. We find these outsiders in our society, and we are the ones who are taking risks to talk to them about everything. But it, perhaps it's really the other way around. Might we lower our buckets and try to fetch some water that allows us to see that maybe it's the outsiders in our lives who are the ones who are actually risking everything to fill us up and nourish us? What if the outsiders are the ones saving us? Jesus offers us the needed lens to flip the script and seeing those considered to be on the outside as saving agents is definitely what we need to be taking a look at. Jesus also reminds us to lower our buckets and our need to help others see who he is. 
You know, when Jesus first encounters the woman and they are exchanging pleasantries, the conversation shifts as Jesus begins to offer her a glimpse as to who he is. He tells her things, personal things, that only she would know, which makes the woman use her own knowledge and experience in expressing that she knows she's dealing with something that she understands or someone she understands to be a prophet. And she's not wrong in that assessment. Jesus certainly acts and proclaims like the prophets of old, and these similarities are a way for her to express her view of him. It's a helpful starting point in a relationship that is developing. It gives affirmation to the old saying saying that we have to meet people where they are. Jesus allows this openness in their relationship, and he doesn't immediately correct her. He allows the conversation to continue in order for her to come to her own eventual conclusion. We too should see the value in meeting people where they are. We as Christians don't need to be on guard or in defense of Christ all the time because I'm pretty sure Jesus can handle what is thrown at him or supposedly done so in his name. You know, he can shoulder all that because he already has. What if Jesus What if he had immediately corrected her when she called him a prophet? What would have happened? But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at all. He doesn't interrupt her. Her, He doesn't interrupt her train of thought. He doesn't butt in. Ever have someone do that when you're talking? There used to be this show when I was growing up, and I think it was a series of books, too. It was called Encyclopedia Brown. And it was this kid who was supposed to know everything, and he would constantly correct people and interrupt them, and he would start many of his sentences with, well, actually, it happened this way. And Jesus just doesn't do that here. You know, instead, he allows the woman to name that what she knows at some point in time, or she, excuse me, but instead allows the woman to name that she knows at some time the promised Messiah is coming. She comes to see him as that Messiah. But this act is done so because there was space allowed for her thought to be reached and not dictated. For as followers of Jesus, maybe we need to see the benefit of showing people who Jesus is before we tell them who he is. In the words of scholar Anna Carter Florence, maybe the woman needed to confront the supernatural power before she could see the messianic truth. Maybe we all need to do that. Which leads to our final example of lowering our buckets. Sometimes, maybe not just lowering our buckets, sometimes we just have to drop them where they are and run and tell people what we've experienced. The woman at the well, after coming to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah, runs off and begins to tell people that there is a man I met who told me everything I ever did. Can we imagine someone doing that to us? You know, I've been thinking about that, and I'll be honest, if someone came up to me and began reciting all the past events of my life, I would probably do more than drop a bucket and run away screaming. (laughs) Well, maybe I would do that, but I probably wouldn't do it for the same reason she did. I would do it because my face would turn red. I would do it maybe because the things that were brought up made me relive a past experience, you know, that I was trying to forget. Maybe I would have to confront a shame that I just was not willing to share with anyone, let alone myself. All of these things are good reasons for the woman to run off and leave her bucket just sitting there. But that's not the reason I believe she makes a quick exit. Because why would someone want their dirty dirty laundry aired for all the world to hear? Why would that be so exciting? The reason is this, and I believe this to be true. As often in biblical stories, we only get a piece of what's happening. And as one of my former professors used to say, you got to pay attention to the white space as much as the black space in Scripture. Meaning, of course, that the words tell us something, but what, that what isn't said, what isn't written down, tells us something too. We are told that you know, we can read that, that black space in the, in the Scripture this morning, that the woman ran away telling folks, he's told me everything I've ever done. But what causes her to proclaim this for all to hear is the unprinted continuation of that sentence. He's told me everything I've ever done, and he's loved me anyway. What a liberating message, and one that adds to our image of God as a liberating God. 
one that gives good news to the poor, heals the brokenhearted, and sets the captive free. This is something that is both physical and spiritual and implies the emptiness we experience both physically and spiritually that God cares equally for both and we need to see the value in both. We as Christians like Jesus can meet physical needs, but what a miracle it is to to be with someone and know their fallibility, to acknowledge their shortcomings, to tell them I see the pain your shame causes you and I love you anyway. That's drinking something deep. That, my friends, is life-giving water worth fetching. Today, as we prepare ourselves for whatever news is to come in the following days, I encourage you to see the value in emptying yourself. Lent teaches us we should let go and give up things, and as we are hearing now for some of us, giving up being around a large group of people, even if we don't have compromised immune systems, is a good practice in order to flatten the curve and to halt the spread of the virus. We can empty ourselves. And when we are empty and we get so thirsty that we can't stand it, let us find comfort knowing we can lower our bucket for someone and we can allow someone to lower their bucket for us. I've had a few people reach out to me asking for ways they could help those in our community who might be sick or have a higher risk of getting this virus by offering to go grocery shopping. grocery shopping. We talked about some of that this morning. These are small but impactful acts of kindness that let people know that they're not alone. That's what lowering the bucket for some of us might look like. The truth is we're gonna get through this because we love one another and we are creative and we are resourceful in how we interact with each other. The same spirit that was with Jesus at the well, that was with the woman who sat across from him, That same spirit is in us too. So let us lower our bucket as the church at this time to give the world a glimpse as to how Jesus would act during a moment like this. And who knows, maybe later, because of our actions, we'll get the chance to share with the world later who he actually is. Amen. Amen.